were destined to win. We gotta turn it around. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank Santora, and I wanna welcome you to Destined to Win. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit or start a new one with no success at all? Well, what if I told you that you don't need stronger willpower, you just need to literally change your mind. Every thought, every action, every reaction we have creates ruts in the brain and it creates a track that we unconsciously follow, whether we intend to or not. I hope you'll join me today as I share with you how you can retrain your mind in our series, Mental Health Goals. This is how you develop good habits and have winning days. You use ritual reminders. What is a ritual reminder? It is a visual reminder that helps anchor you to a healthy habit. A visual reminder that helps anchor you to a healthy habit. The Jewish people used a mezuzah as a ritual reminder. What's a mezuzah? It's in essence something that they hang on their door, door post that reminds them to speak scripture. So basically, every time they go in and they go out, they see the mezuzah there, and they're supposed to remember to speak the word of God over their house, over their family, over their kids. It is a visual reminder that anchors them to a healthy habit. Matter of fact, I believe that it was born out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen to what it says. These are the words which I command you today, that they shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Can I just stop for a second? Why doesn't my child follow God? Not always the case, but did you teach the Scripture diligently to your children? You don't have to wonder why they're not following God if you don't teach it to them, right? Now, sometimes you can teach it to them. They can still walk away. That's the story of the, the prodigal son in the Bible. But how many of you know that that son came back? Because the promise of God when you teach the Word of God to your children is when they're old, they won't depart from it. So if they leave, they're coming back because the pull of the word. The word of God is alive and active. And even when you can't reach your kids, guess what can reach your kid? The word of God that has been sown into their heart and the Holy Spirit that will keep drawing them back. Teach them to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you sh they shall be frontlets before your eyes, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. How do we put this into practice? How do we put ritual reminders? Put a scripture on the door, above the door. Get one of them little plaques or something like that. You know, where you, when you walk into your house, you, you see it right there. So that when you walk in, you see that scripture. You know, we have one that says, ask for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Every time we walk in, that's right, that's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to serve the world. We're not going to go the way of the world. We're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to believe the morals of the world. We're going to stay with the Bible. We're not going to let the world define what's right and wrong. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Put a promise up. Put a promise on your mirror in the bathroom. And when you wake up and you're brushing your teeth, stare at that promise. Put a promise in your car on the dashboard of your car. Put a promise on your cell phone. Put a promise on your computer. Use a visual reminder, right? A ritual reminder is a visual reminder that anchors you to a healthy habit. According to rabbinical tradition, David would hang a harp over his bed bay by the open window. And it functioned as an ancient alarm clock. When the north wind started to blow, the sound of the strings would wake him up and he would study the Torah till the breaking of dawn. That's why he wrote in Psalm 108, verse number 2, Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. Why do you write that? Because he had a ritual reminder in his life to remind and anchored him to the healthy habits that were going to transform his life and renew his mind. Maybe you should set your alarm clock so that when it goes off, it's a worship station. It's worship music. So the first thing you hear when you get up in the morning is praises to God. You get up out of bed and you start your day praising the Lord. These ritual reminders don't just help you at the beginning of the day. They help tame your Mr. Hyde all day long. Y'all know Christians, right? You know Christians don't act saved all the time. You know Christian starts off, they're going to love Jesus on a particular day. Then the day gets going, and Christians start acting funny. 
Matter of fact, if you catch a Christian maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you might not even know they're a Christian. After they've been to work the whole time, been, been in, been in uh, traffic the whole time, had a couple of bad situations happened, so on and so forth, you know, it always amazes me when I bump into people, you know, and, and uh, like I bump into clerks at the store and stuff like that, and they got their head down and stuff like that, and they're being all nasty and everything like that, and all of a sudden they look up, oh, hey, pastor, how you doing? All, all of a sudden it just changed, just like on a heartbeat. Here's what we need. We need ritual reminders to keep the winds going, the momentum going for the whole day. Do you know that Daniel had three ritual reminders? You know what they were? Three times of the day. He allowed the clock of the day to be a ritual reminder for him. He prayed at midnight, he prayed at daybreak, and he prayed at midday. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, number 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, this is a decree, you can't pray to anybody other than the idol of the king. When he learned that the decree was published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Oh, I could preach this. When the government put out something that was opposed to the word of God, guess what Daniel did? He did what the word of God said anyway. Oh, I wish I could preach this for a second right here. The church is soft. The church is soft. The government said you can't go to church. Who said? God said do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Back in the early days when there were plagues outside, the church was full of sick people, infirm people. The saints were going onto the street and pulling people into the house of God because how many of you know there's power in the house of God? The church is soft. And Daniel, he said, no, no, sorry. I'm going to be respectful but you know what? I'm going to pray. And he did this when it was hard. When it was hard. Why? Because this is how he stayed triumphant during difficult times. We stay triumphant when we do and practice what the Word of God has to say. We anchor uh, some type of ritual reminder to a holy habit, right? Or to a healthy habit. So one of the things that happened to me is, is, is I got COVID, Right? Thank God, I believe God to heal me from COVID. And, and so when I got COVID, I got blood clots in my legs. And I took medicine, and God healed the blood clots. Because God is the one who is behind healing, amen? No matter how he does it, just matters that it does it. And so one of the things they told me, they said, well, you know, you have to drink a lot of water, and you have to keep moving all the time. So you know what I did? I started anchoring through ritual reminders uh, certain things that were going to remind me to walk and drink water. So here's what I do. Every day at, t at 12 o'clock, when, when the clock hits 12, I get up, I walk. Y'all have been seeing me walk, and I just walk around the church and walk around the church and walk around the church. And you know what I do when I'm walking around the church? Either I have a staff meeting with somebody or I pray as I'm walking around the church. That's called habit stacking, by the way. So I walk, then when 5 o'clock comes around, guess what I do? Before I go home, I walk, and I walk, and I walk, and I walk. And that's after I get up at the crack of dawn every morning and get on that Peloton. And, or start doing a P90X or something like that. So three times a day, the alarm clock tells us my ritual reminder. You know how I drink water? Every time I got to pee on my way to the bathroom, I guzzle water. <laughs> I'm going to pee anyway, right? I think this is a good time to get some water in me. And so those are just ritual reminders, simple things that anchor to holy habits. Holy, what was Joshua's ritual reminder? He had two. Number one was the ark. The ark was a reminder that God's presence was with him and the children of Israel always. In the text, we find that the ark went before them, that it stood in the middle of the Jordan River as they passed by, the priest stood with the ark, and then after everybody went by, it came after them. The ark was their ritual reminder of the presence of God, that God's presence was with them always, that he goes before them, that he stands beside them, and that he is 
behind them. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but God wants you to know he goes before you to clear the way so that you can get to where he has destined for you to go. And then while you are transitioning, he stands right by your side, even in the hard times. And then after you made it through, he takes up the rear guard to make sure you don't go back to where he has delivered you from. He goes before you, he stands beside you, and he is behind you. The ark was their ritual reminder. Is your life going in the direction that you want it to? For your career, for your finances, and for your relationships? Did you know that the thoughts you think influence your direction more than anything else? That is why your mind is being targeted by the enemy. Pastor Frank Santora sounds the alarm in an effort to help you stay woke to the strategies the enemy uses to keep you from renewing your mind. Using recent discoveries in epigenetics and solid biblical teaching, he reveals how you can change the course of your life by changing your mind in his latest ebook, Stay Woke, The Keto Diet for Your Mind. In it, he will show you where your spiritual diet may have gone off track and show you how to feed your mind the right diet in order to enjoy spiritual fitness. Just visit www.franksantora.cc to download your free copy today and prepare to be changed. This is not a diet book, rather a guide to total life change by getting your thinking on track. But notice, God is upstream in the city of Adam. Now this is powerful because Adam is a symbol of the ultimate time God stepped in. Adam is a symbol of the ultimate time God stepped in. Adam was created to live in the paradise of God. Adam was created to have unbroken fellowship with the Father. Adam was created to live forever. Adam was created to provide God with a family to love and care for, but Adam messed up. Adam sinned, and all sorts of messed up circumstances entered the world. Sin is responsible for the messed up circumstances in the world. Not God, but sin. How many of you believe God wants you to sin? Good. That's theologically correct. If God doesn't want you to sin, then God didn't want any of the consequences of sin to ever come on you. Right? But Adam sinned, and all the bad consequences came in, and it seemed like mankind was doomed. But what happened? God stepped in. When it looked like mankind was doomed, what did God do? He stepped in. The waters were shut off at the city of Adam. Why is he using the city of Adam? Because that is the ultimate example of when God stepped in. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first man, Adam, was a living being, but the last was a life-giving spirit. God stepped in. He stepped into the mess. He stepped into the trial. He stepped into the storm. He stepped into the sickness. He stepped into the setback. He stepped into the situation. He stepped in. When you step out, I I wish I had somebody who could help me tonight. When you step out, God steps in. When you step out, God steps in. And all you're stepping out does is release what God has already planned to do. God is not reacting God's like, oh, what am I going to do now? The Father's not calling Jesus and the Holy Spirit together. Can we have a little powwow and figure out how we're going to do this? Stepping out, all it does is release what God has already planned. How do I know this? Because the waters stopped upstream 19 miles away at a city called Adam. Adam is an example of when Jesus became or stepped into our situation. Well, when did that happen? Somebody said, well, it happened almost 2,000 years ago. You would be wrong. Jesus didn't step in 2,000 years ago. Jesus didn't even step in on the cross. The Bible says he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. See, we operate with time, and so it looks like to us that God is delayed in his response. God's responses are already lined up for you. God's plan for your life, God's purpose for your life, God's will for your life, God's goodness for your life, it's already there for the taking. That's why you make your way prosperous. That's why you have good success, because when you step out, God doesn't just step in, but what God has planned for 
for you all of a sudden begins to materialize in your life. Step out. Get to moving. When you see the ark going before you, move. When you see the ritual reminder, step out. But Joshua had another ritual reminder. It was the, it was the stones. Notice what it says. Before they left the Jordan and before the Jordan River closed back up, God told Joshua, he said, get you 12 men, one from every tribe of Israel, right? And he says, and tell them to go get a stone from under the feet where the priest stood. The priests were holding the ark. The power of God was responsible for the miracle. Go get a stone, not from anywhere. Don't get a stone from the riverbank. Don't, don't get a stone from the wilderness. Get a stone from right underneath the feet of the priests. Take a stone from the mist of the Jordan River, Joshua chapter 4, verse number 5. Carry over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan River, and each one of you shall take a stone on your shoulder. Take something from under the feet of the priest that is heavy, a stone, put it on your shoulder, that's heavy enough to remind you of how hard it was when you were stuck in the middle of your situation so that you won't go back, so that you won't do what the enemy wants you to do and go back to where God has delivered you from. Take a ritual reminder that lets you know that being stuck in that mess was heavy. Why do you ever want to go back again? Stones are ritual reminders that prevent us from going back and that help us win the days that are ahead by staying on course. Jesus told the paralyzed man, remember the guy called him Matt, the paralyzed man, why? Because he was carried on a mat by his four friends. I don't know his name, but I call him Matt. His friends carry him all that distance, rip up with the roof, lower him down to Jesus, Right? Jesus eventually, first he says, your sins are forgiven. Everybody gets mad that he forgives sins. He says, so that you will know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins because forgiving sins is a greater miracle than healing your body, although they're, they're connected on the cross. Although they're connected on the cross. Some people got some foolish theology. Well, it's not, every, not, will, not God's will for everybody to be healed, then it's not God's will for everybody to be saved. Why? They're connected on the cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. I say unto you, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Now, if that was me, I would have said, rise and walk. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, rise, take up your mat, and walk. And if I was mad, I would have looked at Jesus, and said, I don't want to have anything to do with that mat ever again. What do you, Jesus, I'm leaving the mat right here. Jesus said, no, 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 no. You need a ritual reminder. Take this home with you, Put it on the wall in your house. Put it somewhere you, where you could see it so that every time the enemy tries to pull you away, every time your life tries to go in this direction, you look at that mat and you say, all my life until I met Jesus, I was lying on that mat. But when I met Jesus, he caused me to get up from that mat. That's my stone. That's my stone. You remember when David was on the run from Absalom? David was on the run. Absalom, his son, was trying to overthrow him. And David didn't know where to go. He didn't have no food. He didn't have no, no weaponry, right? He's on the run. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go. And he runs to Nob. Nob was where the house of God was, the temple of God. And when David had nowhere to run, guess where David ran? to the house of God. Nowadays, you've got to beg people to come out to church because COVID's more contagious here than it is out there. See, sometimes, see, I'm really polite when I'm not preaching, but when I'm preaching, I'm not that polite. Because when I'm preaching, what happens is I start to begin to deal with stuff that the enemy has duped you into believing. You know what this pandemic has done? It's lured the church into a sleep. 
Let's pluck people off. I don't need church. I need to come out to the house of God. You ain't reading your Bible. When David had nowhere else to go, he ran to Nob, to the house of God, where the priest was and where the showbread was. And when he got there to Abimelech, you know what he asked Abimelech? He said, I'm starving. Can I get something to eat? And you know what Abimelech did? He said, the only thing we got here is the showbread. You couldn't eat the showbread. That was only for the priest. But how many of you know when you go to the house of God, you get living bread. You get the bread of life that you need. And don't tell me you can understand it all by yourself. I know you got the Holy Ghost, but God has gifted certain people to give us things. that Some of y'all came and you never even heard the word knob. You don't even know what the showbread was. He came and said, I got to eat. I'm hungry. Hungry. And he said, well, there it is. Go ahead and eat. And David ate the forbidden bread in the house of God. Why? Because grace always triumphs over the law. Because it's the letter of the law that kills. But it is the spirit of the law that gives life. And he said, can I, can I get the bread? And he ate the bread. And then he said, I need a weapon. He said, and guess why I came here? He said, because I knew that the sword of Goliath was here. He said, he said, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. Look at this, 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 9. So the priest said, the sword of the Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If, if you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. That's the only weapon we got. He said, I got nothing else to help you defend yourself. Just that. And David said, look what David said. Oh. There's nothing like it. Oh, give that one to me. Why that sword when David was on the run? Why that sword when David was being hunted? Why that sword when David, when the odds were stacked against David? Because that sword was a reminder that if God be for him, who can be against him? That sword was a reminder that greater is he that was in David than he that is in the world. That sword was a reminder that if God is on your side, your enemy is your underdog. That sword was a reminder. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no seed wide enough. Ain't no giant big enough. That sword was a reminder that no matter how how hard it gets, God can always cut off the head of your giant. That sword was a reminder to keep David doing what God had asked him to do because eventually where God wanted him to be, he'd get back to. That was his stone. So your mind matters more than you thought, right? In order to change your life, you have to change your mind, but can only be accomplished when you use God's mighty weapons. If you'd like some additional encouragement, I've not only prepared some audio lessons, but a practical study guide as well to aid you in your journey to accomplishing your mental health goals. Check this out. Your mind matters more than you think. If you have ever tried to break bad habits, tried to establish better relationships, or tried to follow through on resolutions without success, then there is good news for you. It's not a matter of increasing your willpower, it's a matter of changing your mind. In his Mental Health Goals Volume 1 study guide set, Pastor Frank Santora explores the mighty weapons God has given us to eliminate bad habits and repeal the cycles that keep defeating us. This first volume not only includes three powerful digital audio lessons on a USB drive, but also a companion study guide booklet with fill-in notes and prompts for your personal study. This first volume is available alone for your gift of $20 to the ministry. But if you would like to take the next step to replace the old habits and thoughts with new ones, Volume 2 introduces the mighty renewing weapons in four additional lessons that reinforce that what you see in your mind and say with your mouth, you will do with your life. For your gift of $40 to the ministry, you will receive both Volumes 1 and 2 for a total of seven digital lessons and two companion study guide booklets to help you achieve your mental health goals. Just visit franksantora.cc to order today. 
Focusing on our mental health is not a new idea. God has already laid out how we can deal with these struggles right in His Word. So be encouraged. You do have the ability to change your mind and rewire your brain to form beneficial habits, but only when you rely on God's wisdom and strength. And that's all possible because with Jesus, you're destined to win. If you're in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc slash live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, God bless you, we love you, and we'll see you next week.